Colorado State University, graduating with a degree in watershed sciences in 1986. He worked for the USGS in southern Colorado, and a couple years later accepted a job offer from the USDA Soil Conservation Service Snow Survey Office in Salt Lake City. In 1991, the Boise, Idaho Snow Survey Office advertised their first ever water supply specialist position. Ron applied, got it, and won the best job anyone could have. He was with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service Idaho Snow Survey from 1991 to 2019. Since retiring in 2019, he spent his free time rafting and skiing and spending time with his wife, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Now that my Janice is going to record it, that hopefully turned out the first time, but we might try again in case it did. So thanks for inviting me out here, Shirley. Um, her husband, Bill, Andre was here earlier. I used to work with him up until 2005 when he retired from IDWR. So he taught me some tricks of the trade and how to keep things simple. The graphs I'll have are a bit complex if you haven't seen them. So just ask questions or we have some time as well, too. So just uh, lots going on and want to share it as well, too, and try to educate others to keep keep it going, because uh, that's part of the talk, is how much we can learn from our past to help predict the future, because things keep changing as well, too. So this is, uh, we'll talk about why I was optimistic about this year as well, too, and some of the other topics in here, too, the snow conditions, stream flow projections, and drought, and along with these uh, uh, relationships. Any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I'll run the slides as well, too. And I um, have about an hour or so, so it worked out well. Um, but this is basically an understanding where we are on the snow or stream flow hydrograph and the relationship with future weather events provide a better understanding of future outcomes. And uh, year after year, for 30 years, this is what we talked about. The, the fall conditions, uh, what, where the reservoirs were in the fall, and then we start the volume forecast in January, so you see the reservoir operators start fine-tuning the reservoir storage for too much or too little. Like the Boise this year, it's had an uh, outflow of uh, 220 CFS since they shut the gates last fall, basically, trying to save as much as they can. And now here's where we are with the critical thresholds. Timing of the snowmelt peak flows, have the rivers peak check. These are questions we always got. Uh, the Wahi River, we'll talk about that, and we will see that it did peak from the snow melt, but for rains, we're going to get another peak. And then the low flow forecasts, uh, we're going to be so low that the water rights, with the senior water right, which I think is a 180 CFS in a big wood basin, if they're going to get cut off again. And a couple of years ago, I told them, no, there's no way we're going to get that low, and that, that's all they wanted to hear, was we had too much snow and water feeding the stream. So little relationships like that can make people happy. So here's a 2017 uh, snowpack for the Big Wood Basin. When I talk about the snowpack, basically it's a measure of inches of water in the snowpack. So the black line is average here. So it's 15 inches of water in the snowpack waiting to melt. Uh, that's not the depth. We got up to uh, the depth would be twice that basically in, a, in, a, in a April 1st time. So 30 inches. And we're up to 30 inches of water. So it's the amount of water in the snowpack just waiting to melt. That's what we measure the most. What, what's considered the big wood basin? Or Sun Valley and Ketchum is. Oh, okay. Uh, north of Twin Falls. So there's the, the Weezer, Payette, Boise, Big Wood, and the Big Lost and Little Lost before you get to Upper Snake. And we'll kind of cover the whole state as well, too, because that was a fun part of my job covering it. They never give me one basin just to talk about. <laughs> that would have been too easy. <laughs> so just a quick review for you as well, too. Uh, a lot of times we're going to talk about El Nino and La Nina. And this is a La Nina weather pattern we're in. So typically the storms come from the Pacific Northwest, like they have been this year. In the ocean, the equator temperatures in the ocean are cooler than normal in the La Nina and warmer than normal in the El Nino. And one lady was asking about that about El Nino, where it came from. And actually, about the 1300s, they noticed the, the fishing went sour 
in uh, around Christmas time, back in the 1300s, because the waters warmed up so much. So it's a relationship they've been watching a long time. And then the opposite one is La Nina. And actually, there's a third one, a neutral condition as well, too. So this was a La Nina. This El Nino, the storms come from the southwest and benefit the, the desert southwest, basically. Another uh, major climate indices that we watch is the Southern Oscillation Index. So the barometric pressure between Darwin and Tahiti in the Pacific Ocean. Just to measure the difference. And this just shows a correlation between this index and a stream flow. So in La Nina years, we're wetter than normal and drier than normal down here. The yellow is kind of kind of middle road. There's no, not very good correlation uh, south of the Boise, the Bigwood Basin, to Cedar City or it's a little bit down here. But the key is what happens in the Pacific Ocean between July and November correlates our, with our winter snowfall. So it gives us a six month indicator of what, what we should be looking at. And a clear water basin in northern Idaho has best correlating. It's like a 0.67 correlation, which is pretty good. Well, this is an old study as well, too, from the early 90s. So things change. But I still refer back to it because we still follow those trends. Now, uh, the third climate index basically is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And it's a colder spot south of Alaska here in this area here. Here's the La Nina. And the, the big picture, here's the colder water here versus a warm phase when it's warmer right there. So this is a busy long-term graph, but it shows this PDO used to flip-flop every 20 or 30 years, so it's more stable. So during the the drought years from 27 to 47 is in warm, then it went from 47 to 77 was in the cool phase. Those are some big winters we had 74 in the 60s as well, too. And then back dry again from 77 to 97. Uh, and then in 97 it flipped, but it's been unstable, so it's not as steady as it used to be every 20 or 30 years. I actually didn't know this went back as far as it did to 1854. And I put this other relationship in 1806 when Lewis and Clark came out of here. They, they found snow 18 feet deep up on Lobo Pass going in Montana. The deepest and highest yeah, snow survey we ever measured was only 10 and a half feet deep. And our records only go back 50 or 60 years. As it never said, uh, you can't get over Lobo Pass until the rivers come up and the snow goes down, basically, is when you can get by. So they had a two week extended vacation in Idaho, uh, staying here. And this is what I've been talking about for 30 years, this relationship between snowpack and stream flows. And so this was a book, uh, Murray Preston, he's a meteorologist out of Pocatello, and he took all the, uh, all the weather facts out of the Lewis and Clark journals and put them in his own book, basically. Because they did a great job tracking uh, plants and weather and a lot of information in their journals. So, he said, up they went. First they found four feet of snow, then eight feet, then 12 feet. And on June 17th, they ran snows with depths up to 15, 18 feet. The trail which the Indians marked by scratching trees in the higher snow seasons was not visible due to the high snowpack. The winter began extremely wet in a potential El Nino pattern. The excess snows of this particular year forced the expedition to retreat for the first time. And I got to talk to Janice, my wife Janice, who used to be a fourth grade school, school teacher. But Lewis or Clark retreated also on the Salmon River. They tried to go down the Salmon River, and got, the water was too big, so they, they came back. But this time they were together and they retreated for the vacation in Idaho, back by Kuski. On so, the way back. What's that? On the way back. On the way back. But yeah, I mean, that's the first time they were forced to retreat. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I got to talk to Vern as well, too, because this would have been more of a La Nina pattern with the storms coming from the northwest than El Nino. So I'll have to see what he meant by that. Yeah, at the bottom here, I think I was going to comment. It says, told us in 60 years. Oh, yeah. Right. So so this year, when they measure the ocean temperatures up there off Alaska here, um, it was the coldest in 60 years since 1950. Uh, so it was on the bottom of another chart as well, too. And so that was part of the reason for the cold temperatures this year and why I'm still optimistic. 
So something happened that's getting back in to be colder than normal up there. Um, if I could tell you where those heating vents come from that drive the ocean currents between the warm temperatures and the cooler temperatures, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> So here you need easterlies and westerly winds to maintain these, these El Nino conditions on the equator. If, if you don't get the, the winds, then the other one won't go, and vice versa. And this other one, the PEO, is interesting as well, too. But that's, we've just learned these relationships over the years. And um, so these are three main, major driver factors out of, uh, there's about 20 atmosphere teleconnections. So I'm not going to bore you with the other ones, because they're, they're not as major as these. But folks like Pete Parson and other many others correlate this information in past years to help predict the coming of the year. And Pete Parson's out of the Oregon State University, I believe. And he got together with Jan Curtis, who used to work for USDA, retired meteorologist, very sharp guy. He used to use a lot of his forecasts as well, too. So Pete and Jan put their heads together to come up with the best way to figure out the analog years based on those indices we just talked about. And this was from a year ago, back in February 21. And analog years of 71, 96, and 08, based on the La Nina conditions. And so, a year later, this year we have back-to-back -back La Nina years. And uh, yeah, so one year later, so this is March 2022, and so Pete kept, kept the same analog years, but he just added one year to it, basically. So now it's 72, 97, and, and 09 compared to the, the previous ones that we used the year before because we got back to back La Nina years. And that doesn't always happen, but it does. And there was a good correlation there. And so this was his March forecast showing up a relatively cool and damp April is predicted with elevated chances of Western Valley frost events, just like we're having today. That's in line with the general expectations for an early spring during a lightning episode. And then in contrast, the warm and dry May is predicted is not as common during La Nina, and that may melt the mountain snowpacks faster once we get into May. So my talk here is really what we, we need some good moisture for the rest of April and May as well too. And we're going to compare this to 2009 quite a bit because these were huge years and we we're not tracking those years at all. So I kind of threw those out the window. But we'll talk about 09 quite a bit because of uh, historically what's happened. What does the word analog refer to? Just trying to come up with a similar relationship, um, similar conditions, and what happened in those previous years to, to this year. And so those are his analog years for this year. And mainly because they're back to back La Nina years. And that's where we're, we are now. We're two La Nina years in a row. So here's a couple of busy graphs showing the North Pacific Ocean. And the PDO temperatures cooling off to December, being the coldest in 60 years. And the other years are 72 and, and 09 as well, too. Has there ever been any period when there was more, more than back to back? Like three? Yes. Or four? Yeah, three. It happened three. at least twice. I think one was in the 50s. And uh, we'll see if it happens next year for back to back to back colliding years. Or looking at this next graph, this is one of the ocean temperatures. And you can see the three years pretty tight together here with this year and the other analog years. But they have those all warmed up to be an El Nino year uh, for the next year. And so if you could root for something, I'd say root for an El Nino year. Because that's when the storm's coming from the desert southwest and pushing that southern Idaho. We still get a good, get a good snowpack as well, too. But well, they, well, excuse me. Well, either one of those coming in from the north or coming from the south, well, can either one of those, or do both of them drive them out the same amount of moisture? Just depending on where they drop it. So from the north, do they typically get more moisture out of those than the ones from the south? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I think from the north would be more.
board based on the next slide I'll show you. So I've never thought about that. Uh, but the desert southwest gets less snow to begin with, but, so they'll take a good snowpack anytime while the Cascades get quite a bit. And they're the ones that set the record high snowfall back in 97, 98 with a thousand inches, 100 feet of snow they had. So it's got to be from the Pacific Northwest where more of the storm, the moisture, more moisture is available. So that's what I'm hoping for, a big El Nino year, because what happens is a year after the big El Nino year was 2017, and that's when the oceans and atmosphere have a lot of energy to get in, into, get, get rid of, and that's when we had the big snowy year, was 2017. So I'm rooting for a big El Nino year, and then I'll see if Shirley invites me back again, too, oh. <laughs> to use a past project two years out. I'm sure I will. Okay. But I don't want to go two years out, so let alone one year. But we'll talk about what's happening now and why it's a challenge to predict this as well, too. So it's atmospheric rivers. The poles of the Earth are heating up. And the North Atlantic Gulf Stream is weakening uh, as well, too. But I'm still optimistic. So here's a graph that shows uh, 2017, and there's 45 major atmospheric rivers that hit the West Coast. So the majority of it in Oregon and Washington, and one time I heard California needs five of them a year, and three of them bring like 80% of the moisture uh, during the wintertime. This year, I'm guessing we had a dozen or 15 atmospheric rivers at the most, but in 17, we had 45 major, or 45, and there's a category here about how many extremes were three, strong was 12. And the one last fall, that was the one they said there is an equivalent of eight, no, eight, uh, 50 Mississippi, Mississippi rivers was the amount of moisture in the one coming last fall that hit the West Coast. And one time I heard there's one AR with only 10 Mississippi rivers. And so it's a lot smaller. I'm one of those guys, how big is the Mississippi River? So I had to check the size of the Columbia to the Mississippi. Well, let's just say they're similar. <laughs> so. And so then Cliff is another guy I've been watching, Cliff Mass out of Seattle University there, uh, talks about are these events, meteorological events, uh, becoming bigger. And they've always been around February 1986, the snowpack here in the state, especially about the Big Wood Basin in Fairfield, it doubled in a month because uh, the atmospheric river or Pineapple Express is what we used to call it. So they've been around, they're just called changing the term. I forgot about El Nino too, I won't go back, but El Nino, we really didn't know the term of it up until 83, 84, and that was a really big runoff year as well too. And then you figure out what kicked in all the moisture, Lucky Peak Reservoir came that close to topping over, because then it cooled down, and they didn't go over the emergency spillway. Glen Canyon Dam, they couldn't reduce the water coming out of it, because there was so much water going in, Colorado River, that by the time uh, they were able to shut the flow, there's a crater probably the size of this room, 30 feet deep and 30 feet wide, that just cavitated, so they almost lost, lost the dam then too. So a lot more work went into predicting what, what happened with this El Nino widening. Now. now there's, you can ask Janice, but there's not a day that goes by that I don't talk about El Nino and widening. <laughs> so it's more common. And now we're talking about atmospheric rivers as well too. So we've learned a lot in the past uh, 30 years, but things keep changing. So just two weeks ago, March 20th, the both ends of the Earth was heating up. They were uh, 40 degrees Celsius, so say about 7 degrees, 7 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. It was still below freezing, but that's that was throwing some curveballs as well too. So that might have been why we had a warm spell in March. I don't know, but it threw a lot of other scientists. It surprised them to see that major of a change when one pole's going into the spring and one's going into winter. Um, and then he talks about the uh, Greenland ice and Arctic uh, ice sheet is melting, so it's putting cold, fresh water into the North Atlantic and changing that current as well, too. So it's not behaving as it used to, it's a little harder to, to predict. So these are the reasons I might be wrong. <laughs> Uh, so here's another one by Cliff Mass from a month ago, March 10th. 
he put this out and he looked at some long range uh, European uh, models going out 46 days through April 22nd. So we still got 12 days to go. And he thought the Pacific Northwest was going to be here in Boise, Idaho was negative 5.4 degrees below normal for this 46 day period. It kind of seems like it's happening. I mean, we've got a good cold week coming up. We've had some cold as well, too. I didn't know models went out like that for 46 days. And I haven't seen a whole lot that go past April 23rd right now. But we've got a good wet week now with 20 to 30 inches of snow in some of the mountain sites and ski areas. And ski areas are closing up. So but he also got asked about the no, above normal precip in the mountains for this uh, time period as well, too. Um, and a couple other indices I still watch is this uh, uh, Pacific North, North American pattern. And basically, it's when it goes negative is when we get some weather. And this is what's happening right now with this storm here. And then it goes back up to near zero um, later this month. But here's a cool wet spell we had in mid-December to early January that brought the weather and the snow to our state back then as well, too. Just what we needed. So it gives you a little indicator for one to two weeks out, like, you know, where I might want to go skiing. So I watch it like every day. They update this about midnight every night as well, too. So I don't, I don't want to miss anything. <laughs> if you have a boring life like me. <laughs> and the other guy is out of Salt Lake City. He watches the buoy pop. So in the buoy, pops about two weeks later is when the storms come in. So he's predicting one on tax day, the 15th. And this was from April 2nd as well, too. So the ocean kind of just swells, raising about a height of seven, seven feet or so. And then there's a, just a relationship you got to figure out with the storms. So when the ocean swells, we get more precipitation? Is that what you just said? It's in a certain area where the buoys are located. I asked them to be brief when I started following them on the Facebook page. Hey, what's this correlation? And I said, just keep it simple. But he didn't really tell me. <laughs> and so there's been a lot of research, and they, they look for two weeks out, and that's all I'm doing as well, too. Here in the Pacific North, or yeah, the Northwest is where we get these storms when it goes negative. They don't always work, but they give you some indication what, what to expect when you're going hunting or not to get into that country. So here's a, we'll talk about this year now and how we got here. It was a January 6th picture took a bogus basin. Um, it was a major, a major sunset. I think everybody took a picture uh, that, that night. And then at Moore's Creek, after they reopened it on January 8th, about noon, I went up there at 1 o'clock. Um, yeah, Jason could help me on I only remember Highway 21 closing like three times. Like January 1997 event, we'll talk about this event. One or, one or two more. It doesn't typically close with Highway 21 in Morris Creek, not like Bowman and Banner Summit. Uh, so they have quite a bit of snow during a short time period from time to time. So we'll talk about uh, building up this snowpack and the water supply and what goes into it is the fall conditions. At first, you get the fall precipitation to, to soak into the ground to help prime the soils from the dry summer we just had. And then you get the snowpack on top of it. Now in the springtime, you get the spring rains uh, melting as well, too, the snowpack. So it's part of that hydrograph, knowing where you are. And so I'd like to show this while I'm still optimistic that we're in better shape than last year. And this was a September through October precipitation from a year and a half ago, how dry it was uh, that fall. And then uh, this past fall, going into this winter, this is September to November. Uh, you know, about near normal, basically. Ab white is average in central Idaho. But I remember here, I couldn't include November because Bogus got 30 inches of, of snowfall one day, basically there. I was still brush cutting up there. It's like, I get back up there. So it was a dead end place. So I couldn't do it like that. So I skied in there, and the snow was still brush cutting. And so, but what that did, that snow sealed that dryness into the, into the ground last year. That snow remained and it remained dry all winter long because we didn't have any fall rains really up until the snow fell because of this dry spell. This year we're in much better shape with the 
the soils wetter than a year ago. And the Bureau also talked about they're going back like five or 25 years, and this was the fifth coldest soil temperatures they had too at some of the Kaepernick sites. So that may help delay uh, agriculture irrigation in this later because of the cold, cold winter we had. So this is all good news still. And then in January hit, and then we got the dry spell, and little precipitation fell, zero to 20% in shades of red. January to February, but it's very similar to 2009, one of those analog years. But the soil moisture under the pack remains the same from last fall. It's still, still wet and frozen. It didn't go anyplace. And so we had two dry months, but then the moisture was going up the Ohio River Valley, and this is a USGS stream flow, so black is record high for that given day of February 19th. So that's where they get the storm, but we're pushing record low for stream flow because it's cold and nothing's happening. But then the first atmospheric rivers start coming in again in March, and that's when they came through the Cascades and in northern Idaho. So this prime the soils again too. So I know they're wet, especially in northern Idaho, because they've been flowing already. So just trying to show you why I'm optimistic. Uh, and then, uh, let's see where we get to. Okay, the current west wide snowpack. Sixth. Percentages were a little bit higher, but because of the mid March warm spell, they started decreasing. And usually, they don't hit until around early April. So, shades of red is less than 50% of normal in parts of Oregon and pushing near normal in northern Idaho. Colorado is doing better than Idaho, too. They got some of those late, late season storms. And the snow power, no, that's water year to date precipitation. So, we start recounting the, the precipitation by October 1 because it starts to rejuvenate the rejuvenization of our water year our moisture. So it's the end of the summer and things start greening up. So in North America, we use this water year. And imagine other countries, other places, they use a different water year. But, um, you can tell how much better we are this year, the Bigwood Basin, 86 to 99 in the Littlewood, and 94 in the Bigwood, while last year they're only 61 to 62 percent. Across the Bruno was 90 last year, 96 this year. Both wetter. Northern Idaho, Clearwater's the same. And Northern Idaho is a little bit wetter too. So that's a total precipitation. Some fell on the ground and some is still in the snowpack. And then the snowpack from April 6th, kind of a snow drought, we called it. I guess I first used that term in 2012 when our daughter was going to a ski racing event at Boca this thing. There wasn't enough snow to have a race, so they moved somewhere else. So I started using the term snow drought uh, because it, it happens. Does, does, does all the water, I'm not familiar enough with the river system, um, so does all the water, the runoff, the melt from Little Wood and what's the other one up there? Big, big, big Wood? Yeah. Does, where does it, all that water go? Does it go down to? What goes into Anderson and Arrow Rock and Lucky Bay? No, well, it's just a little wood is is uh, here. And here's the big wood. Okay, I was off a little bit. Little wood, and then uh, part of the big wood it gets to the mouth of the canyon there um, at the rest area, and then it goes in Silver Creek. So a lot of water goes underground into Silver Creek, and then those three rivers come together: Little Wood, Silver Creek. Where does Silver Creek end up in the big wood? The little wood. But then they form the Balad River, where the Balad Gorge is on the freeway, and it drops about 100 feet down, where the trailer went off the bridge last uh, right, right. a year ago. Was yeah. it? So that's the Balad River, one of the shortest rivers in the state, because it's where the two wood rivers come together, and it goes down to the Snake River. And so that's how those two get to the Snake. The Big Lost and Little Lost and Birch Creek area, uh, this area, they come down here, and, and it's kind of like a giant candy cane, and head into the big, big lost sinks. And in the big years, when the big lost river is flowing all through Arco, back in 2017 it was, and the late 90s as well too, the water sinks into the ground, then it comes out in Twin uh, Thousand Springs area along the Snake. So, so none of that water runs into Anderson. 
No, no. no. So the Boise Basin has its own reservoirs that I'll show you here in a second. Uh, Anderson, Arrow Rock, and uh, Lucky Peak. And then the Payette Basins are Deadwood and Payette. And they flow into the Snake here separately. Okay. And the Y comes in from this side. Um, but now the, the big loss, the unique ones, they go subsurface and they show up anywhere oh, 75 to 150 years later. And some of the water is moving in the ground fairly fast velocities. That's the Eastern Snake River Aquifer we'll talk about at the very end. So then just a big picture of the U.S. drought uh, map showing none is white, which is Ohio River Valley, where it showed you where the flooding or the record high flows were just a month or so ago. And northern Idaho as well, too, in the Cascades. Well, Idaho is more shades of a moderate to severe drought, and red is a more extreme pockets of Nevada and California. So these were interesting. About 20 years ago, uh, they, this group out of the University of Nebraska started putting this drought monitor together. And they're asking for input from every state. So I share my input, and I was only wanting to provide input for several years. But there's about a dozen authors, and they're, they all live east of the Mississippi River. So they really didn't understand snowpack, rivers, and reservoirs, and how we operate here that we rely here on the snow that falls in Wyoming. So that it helped educate them to bring them up to speed about droughts or not in, in the mid-2000s. Now David Hokema from IDW, he has a meeting every couple weeks with a small committee to get input from the locals. The drought monitors, they kind of share their responsibility with the primary uh, meteorologist responsibility, wherever that may be, but they do the report every, maybe, uh, two weeks in a row, four, four times a year maybe. Um, but you get input from all 50 states. And you gotta know what's going on last week and the next week before you jump back into it. So it's a lot of work that goes into this. It's a very complex picture that we try to put a lot into it. Uh, I told them back then, they should call it the water monitor for that reason about Ohio. They're, they have a water surplus now, so it's not a drought. It's one or the other, typically, but they didn't like my idea, so it's called, still called the drought monitor. <laughs> so here's other memories of 2009, one of those analog years that we were talking about from Pete Parson. And April through June precipitation uh, was shades of green pushing up to 150% of average for this time period in here. And the Boise River was flooding back in June in Eagle, Idaho. I didn't remember that. I told some other friends about it when I said, oh yeah, it's we had 23 days in a row. I said, all right. I said, oh, you guys have good memory. <laughs> so I went back and I did the research and yep, yeah, it was wet and it was cold too. So here's the temperatures from April through June with shades of green of minus five degrees Fahrenheit or zero near normal, but it was colder than normal as well too. So cold was good. It delayed the river swing. So that's what I'm, can we still use the past to predict the future as well too? So we'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Here's the Clearwater um, basins in Spokane, Northern Idaho. They're looking at good flows. This was 2006 at so many good flows or 30,000 CRS, which was huge. But here's a next series of hydrographs for stream flow to 2002 or, or for this year. Uh, and then a comparison year is 2021, last year, and 2009 to see it happen. And you can see the Spokane River already popped up already with the, the moisture we had. And so they're better than 21 last year. Uh, maybe they'll make 09 if they get a little bit more moisture as well, too. Uh, when the flow was about 100% of normal back in 2009. And the Selway River, the warm temperatures, it came up once, twice. But it has a similar snow package as last year as well, too. So they're forecasting 96% of normal for April through July. And in 09 it was 112, and 21 it was 92. So being in the middle is a good, good bet, I would, I would say. Then coming down to the Sand River Basin, now this is Black's Creek. I, I, I forget when this rapid happened. Do you remember? 15 years ago, at least, 
But if a salmon falls that it took out, and salmon falls or if it's underwater, this one is still still brown. So it's a little tricky, a little, little bit. There's just 4,000 CFS at the white bird gauge. But, but on a, they were just talking in the news about there's not a boating season, and that's not true. Because what I learned from Bill Andre, again, Shirley's husband, he used to work for IDWR, and it was back in 87 that Jerry Beard and Peter Palmer said that because of the snow drought in 87, there wouldn't be a rafting season in Idaho. And the state of Idaho came unglued. So no, you can't say that. There will be a rafting season because it affects a lot of people's business and income. And so when I started here in 91, we had to write the recreation report that we started, and then we had to fax it to them to review it before we could go to press, go to, press to, to publish it. Uh, so there'll be a rafting season this year. The peaks may be low, but there's still gonna be a, a good flows for boating. You just have to time it right. Was there a rafting season in 87 and 88? Yeah, it was just low, so it didn't last as long, but the rubber outfit was really getting into it and everything, too, but they don't want to hurt your business by people not coming to Idaho to go rafting now. Mm -hmm. And then in the 90s, we had some good wet years, 96, 97, 98, and Doug Timms was with the Idaho Outfitter and Guides Association, so he saw these relationships I was doing with the farmers and irrigators about peak flows and there was a rash of, of deaths from my part rafts. People were getting into and not knowing what they were getting into. So we try to educate the river runners more with uh, some of these peak flow analysis as well, too, to, to help save lives, know when to go, when, when not to go. Some of them I've told earlier that uh, some outfitters, they call Bill Andre up in the state first, then they call me and then call Mary Mellon up in the weather service and get three different opinions for them to decide what to tell their customers and clients coming in from out of state, uh, how high it's going to be or how low it's going to be. So I've learned to talk positive during drought years, but it's because people make mistakes like this. So i got to pass it on to uh, my new co or person that hired to replace me was Aaron Wooten, so I'll have to share some of this information with her as well too. You, you learn by living through the experience, floods and droughts. I gotta do a better job of writing all this down and documenting it. <laughs> so they'll still be voting this year. So here's the Banner Summit. This is one of the famous relationships Peter Palmer came up with that used to be when Banner was half melted, uh, the middle fork of the salmon river would peak. Now it's about 61% melted is when the peak occurs. So here's this year, a little bit less than last year, 2021, and here's 2009, but you can see the cool what spring we had in 09 with two peaks and then it came down later than normal. So cold was good. So let's see where we are. Some of the news channels, channels were saying how bad this year was going to be, but you look at Banner Summit, there's about seven years with less snow than this year. And 2001 was one of them. Here's 1991, 07. I got these all memorized because uh, you recall them during the drought years, 94, 92, 87. But 01, uh, there's one river raptor called up about the peak flows. I said, well, the snowmelt peak just happened and everything based on that relationship. So he took off on vacation, went back somewhere. And then he came back and he said, Ron, I thought you told me that the river peaked. I said, it did, but it rained. And the rain peak was higher than the snow peak. And he was mad because I didn't tell him that. So I learned to tell you about these relationships if they're based on snowmelt, because we can know how much snow is in the mountains. We can see it coming down. I can't tell you how much rain we're going to get next week, but it influences it. So I've learned to talk about these as the snow melt peaks. So here's the middle fork, the Salmon River, uh, for this year. So we had 2002 with the river coming up a little bit, um, just like last year it happens in the springtime. And 2001, from last year in the spring till now, it, it didn't rain and we had hot temperatures in June and July. And so it was dry. And by that time, the snow was melted. So that's what I said. With a little bit of rain, the flow has been better than last year based on the, the soil moisture that we saw from last year and the snow pack this year, even though it's very similar. But maybe not like 2009, unless it stops raining in June. And that's when the flows got to 9,000 and then they finally came down. 
when the flows are about a thousand is two feet on the graph here, is when we typically fly into Audrey Creek rather than putting in, you know, fly into Indian Creek rather than launching Boundary Creek. So it adds a little expense to the trip. Jason's going in the middle fork next in a couple weeks. You're looking at good flows. It's going to be cool and wet this week and then warm up a little bit, maybe. Okay, memory check. Unless you know the answer, I'm going to say it right away. Uh, here's the payout base of your little banks. And when and what you then created, build up or your fire rapid on the payout river of your little banks. Um, where you get the South Fork comes in. 2009 or 97. <laughs> yeah, so it was that rain on snow event. So this was across the road from it, and this just was washed down as a gully wash. It created a new rapid. There used to be a lot more, a lot more, a few homes and trailers there, and private land. The state bought them out because they didn't want to have to keep fixing it up. So that's why Banks is a smaller community now than it used to be uh, because of this major event when this next slide really shows it and this is one of those analog years that Pete Parson picked out but I couldn't keep using it because we weren't tracking like 97 compared to this year the black line we we're tracking more like 09 so that's why I use 09 as my analog scenarios as well too but for Brundage Reservoir Snow Tail site right by this year they got 20 inches of precipitation rain and snow in 15 days so that's when it was falling the snow and all those trees, the branches are accumulating the snow. And then after New Year's Day, it changed to rain. And uh, the trees all, they snapped off like 50, 40, 50 feet above the ground because they couldn't hold the weight anymore from Bogus all the way up to uh, Moore's Creek or Idaho City or there. Janice, my wife, was in the lift lines at uh, Bogus, Bogus Basin. And she said every 10 seconds, you could hear a tree breaking, a tree snapping. And so. We started getting the preset like that for this year, uh, but then it just didn't last as long. So then I plotted this graph of the snow, the snow at Brindage Reservoir. So here's this year in black, about 20 inches is this line here. Last year, or no, 2009, they peaked at 30 inches, which is about normal. But 97 after the wet event, they peaked at about 38 inches. So, but this year is tracking very close to, to 09, so that's why I keep using that as a as a maximum year if it keeps raining. And then last year, last year 21 is a low year as well too. I think I'm in the ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that, that was a cool, yeah, note the late melt these years had as well too. So it'll be interesting to see if that happens this year as well too. We're just at a lower level uh, with less snow. So here's the teacup diagram from the Bureau of Reclamation. So it shows the different basins with the Payette, uh, Deadwood, and what they told me uh, last week, Ryan Hendrickson, Hendrick, uh, said Deadwood will not fill this year. And Cascade might not fill either. And then I put the word unless, unless it rains. <laughs> and then Boise Red, Boise systems, 55% full. So here's Air Rock, the upper one. Or excuse me, Anderson's upper one, then Air Rock's in the middle, and Lucky Peak, and then it flows down here to the Snake River. And then it ends in the Snake Valley. But that'll be three, 300,000 acre feet short of filling as well, too. Question How does this teapot model, does it date the first compared to the original scale? Uh, Good question. Uh, last year, there's probably more watering because they had a better carryover from, from last year, and they used that water up for this past summer. So they did have more water last year. In 97, during that big rain on snow event, on January 15th, they saw how much snow was in the mountains and everything, and they raised the Boise River to 7,000 CFS. Boise at Glenwood now it's at 216. So they raised it January 15th to June 15th. 7,000 came through town because they saw the snow was there or not. They had to empty them by April 1st, basically. So 
So yeah, there, there was more water last year than this year. I'll show you one more for Dr. Smith. Ron, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know the, uh, the strategy behind this, but why is, why is Arrow Rock uh, filled so much as compared to the other two reservoirs? I don't know on that system. Well, why, why, why is that being held in storage? Oh, wait, right. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, usually they try to keep more water in Anderson because it's upstream and you can't pump water back up, so right. they usually try to keep that one more. Um, but then they got more in Arrow Rock. It probably comes back. Lucky Peak was originally built for flood control as well, too. So they keep that lower for, for flood control just in case a rain event were to happen. Um, Jason, do you have any other? He was with Idaho Department of Transportation. It's a complex relationship. Uh, the dam structures themselves are different. The purposes of the reservoir are different. The, the water allocations within them matters. Uh, the rural curves that govern when they release and how much. I mean, it, it's a very complex relationship. So the, the carryover from year to year and how they control flooding things, it all enters into play. Okay. So, so this isn't like a typical yearly strategy hold most of it in, or a lot of it in Arrow Rock to release slowly into Lucky Peak? They usually fill Lucky last. Right. Yeah. But well, whether it's in Arrow Rock or Andy, it depends you know, year to year. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. And usually they keep more upstream in Anderson. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, Arrow Rock is more full this year, so. Was that difficult for Arrow Rock to be more full than Anderson? Well, it's yes. safer for it to be. It's a concrete gravity dam essentially infinite still capacity, so you know, if you ever did get a probable maximum flood event, it, it probably stays, whereas the others are a riskier scenario. So there's a there's a lot that goes into that that I don't know all of the details of. So our reason, our reason, one of our reasons for being here today is to try to understand what's going on in the entire third of the United Western third of the United States because it seems like year after year after year Things are a little bit less humid <laughs> than it was the previous year. Just even less what was in California River. But additionally, we're we're, we're boaters and um, keep going up at certain shores. And so I just met with Sirach Nicole, the manager of Lucky Peak, last Tuesday to try to find out what we could expect this year for boating season. And it's ugly. In fact, if they're gonna at the peak. At peak this year, they're probably going to be 15 to 25 feet below full. And um, the boating season typically is from Memorial Day to Labor Day. We'll probably, and our, we've been there for a long time, so it's not this way out. We'll probably have to pull out this year the second week of July. It's not going to be good. Unless come here, come here, to unless we change the rate. So yeah, yeah, come on. Yeah, exactly. I'm still living in the past. Yeah. We'll see if that can happen. So you're right. Yeah. Um, so you're right. So we have to talk about the what if scenarios. If it had a dry spell like last uh, spring, we'd be hurting like tremendously. But right now it's snow here. Coming here at one o'clock today it was great. Yeah. Come driving home from catching the storm. We're going through a fair pool. It was almost a whiteout up there between the snow and the wind and the clouds coming down. Perfect. So this is going to be a good week. The storms I heard are going to go through April 23rd, and beyond that, I haven't heard because the models are mixed. But this storm for this coming week has been predicted, or it's, it's been on the different models. Um, this diagram is on the Bureau of Reclamation website. The easiest way to find it is just to do a Google search for Boise Bay at Deep House. Yeah. And there are a bunch of hyperlinks in here, so basically all the red text are things you can select. So you can pull up the water you're graph for traffic for Lucky Peak. And Lucky is actually currently right on the path it is on average and it was last year. But half all of the, the future of Lucky, Lucky is right on track. Uh, but the you know future of Lucky Peak is what's in the snow. So that's where the snow and rain for the rest of the spring is so important. Oh, yeah. So they're they're telling you what they know based on the ground today. Right. You know, Rod is trying to uh, what's in clouds essentially? Right. Uh, we yeah. like winters. Yeah, we like winters. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wrong both ways. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, did, some, did 
Did somebody record that? <laughs> so here's a different type of a time series graph for the Boise uh, Basin. So the bottom is the three reservoirs of storage for, for this year and the five exceedance forecasts and this, the top light gray or blue is a previous April through September stream flow. So you see the variability from year to year. Uh, last year, right below here, the threshold for adequate is 1.5 uh, million acre feet, thousand acre feet, and we're here last year. So this is from March 1st, and typically if you have a dry month, so these would drop down one exceedance level. So this April 1 forecast would probably be about here, and this would be even lower as well too. So we're looking at probably similar supplies as, as last year. And it had this 50% of uh, chance of exceedance forecast, the middle of the road forecast happen, you need normal precipitation. So we don't put future precip in our, in our, our models because half times above average, half times below, but it's, it's built in for 50% of normal precip. So it's gonna be drier than normal like last year. We're looking at flows down here. But if it's normal, this could happen. If it's wetter than normal, then we could be up here. What's happening? Uh, if what is, what is, can you really tell me what is normal for the next uh, 60 days? Normal, well, we look at the, yeah, April. Actually, we need precipitation in April, May, and June for spring precipitation because by the time we get to July, our precip here is half an inch. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, that's right. Let's see, does anybody have an idea? What, well, what, what, might, what might be considered normal? Period of time that you just talked about? Uh, for the Boise Basin, yeah, I, I'd have to look at that for the very location. Uh, yeah. So we, uh, what they did this year, I, I, I skipped over it, but they're using we use a three-year uh, normal, and so the World Meteorological Center it says it used the most recent 30 years. So they updated the averages from 1980 to 2010. They were and now they're 1990 to 2020. So it's the past 30 years that we use to compare this to. Uh, they say it's better to compare the most recent two rather than the full period of 80 or 90 years. The NRCS also put a curveball in there. Instead of being an average, they're now using mean. So it changed it a little bit as well too, which is another mathematical problem. The last topic said, you should have just let that slide out. <laughs> so I didn't. <laughs> So, but here's 2017, a huge year that we had, uh, about an El Nino year. The back uh, 1997, 98, 99 were all wet years, record high, or right up there. The droughts of the early 90s and the 2000s as well, too. So I used to plot moving averages as well, too. You can see the cycles of wet pattern and, and dry patterns. Snow you get, it matters if it rains or not in the springtime. And that's when they get the, the runoff. So here's a south mountain uh, in the Wahi Basin. They got the 10 inches of water in the snowpack. The average is about 12, it looks like. 2009 got wet, so it came off later than normal. And here's last year, a little bit more than this year. But when it got here, it was 30% melted, and that's typically an indicator that peak flow has occurred for the Wahi. And uh, that's exactly what happened. So Steve Studen and other people, they went down and it was perfect weather. That's when we're getting 77 degrees and they run a river floating as well too. But before we jump there, here's precipitation for this year, 2009, when we had rain, but we had rain on snow. And then by June, it rained 23 days in a row, but it, there were bare soils. So we didn't get as much runoff in the water basin. So. Here's the graph for this year with the peak flow occurring when the South Mountain was 20, almost 30% melted. And then the cold weather dropped and it came back up. And now we're back down here with the 
the snow's not melting anymore, but there's still a little more snow to come. So we're going to see another peak as well from the snow, and then uh, a little bit of it rains quite a bit, but the rain peaks just only got to the 1500 compared to 2000. Um, so it's really the, the snow peaks that drive our water supply here in the West. That's why we do what we do here. This one. And here's a killer. What was that? Eight days with above freezing temperatures in the mountains. 60 degrees at Focus Basin as well, too. So that's why we started losing more and more snow. But it had been fairly cold this winter, and so it kept a little bit of snow we did have. So that's my good news with some of that. And just moving up to the Upper Snake, where it's not as good news up there either, um, but the reservoir system for Jackson Lake uh, in Wyoming and Palisades is only 36% full. And uh, the snow is 70% normal, but it's less than last year. Here's 2009, so they really need more moisture up here. But here's a graph, we're talking about reservoir spilling now. This was from the Bureau of Reclamation a month ago, and he said there's only a 70% chance that Jackson Palisades won't fill. Because here's the water that was used in 2021 for the reservoir storage for these two, and they used it all up last summer, basically. So this was a carryover from here going into this winter why we're so low right now. So it probably came up a little bit, but so the chance of filling those reservoirs is pretty slim with less snow than you saw on the previous slide as well too. Unless it really rains. But, so that's where more of the concerns are. And I forgot to mention 2009 also, it was about that time of the uh, year in April when there's a lot of water calls being made as well too. There's a lot of issues between groundwater users and surface water users. And some of the cities and towns rely on the groundwater as well, too. They didn't want to lose their wells for the city supply, Jerome and Gooding. So Lynn Tamanaga is with the ID Idaho Groundwater Users Association. He was trying to find water as well, too. And so they're looking at our forecast for 09, how dry it is, but then the weather all changed. And they had so much water in the canals and Twin Falls Canal Company in June. They didn't start irrigating until June of that year because it was so wet. So that one spring really made a difference as well, too. Not saying that's going to happen, but when you see it in the past, you learn to keep your eyes open a little more, too. I love this there, man. So here's the Upper Snake uh, Surface Water Supply Index for the three reservoirs. Where they are this year compared to last year, quite a bit less. So they need more runoff as well, too. And looking at shortages based on all five exceedance forecasts, and less just than, that, than last year. And I had a long term, that long term plot we were talking about. So they asked me to do a 10 year moving average plot to compare the, these drought years to the 30s, and it was nothing even close. The 30s were so much drier than what we had in the 2000s. A different level, basically. And just moving downstream to Hell's Canyon, where our power comes from. Uh, their March 1 forecast was 72% of average uh, for the stream flow. And I mentioned last week, this is in the Hall Creek coming in from the Oregon side over their camp there. And it's a few years ago when, uh, I don't know what they got, 112 degrees here in Boise, and the Pittsburgh Landing got to 117 degrees. And the all-time record in the state of Idaho, I think, is 118 on the Clearwater Basin, but that station doesn't exist anymore. So it's hard to tell if you set a new record at 117 because the old station's not there anymore. So this one, uh, we're on a river, and Sean Parkinson, a buddy of mine with power, got worried about it because one of their power plants went out, and they had to return the river up. They were up to 24,000 CFS coming out of the dam. Usually it's like 15 or 17,000. And this water, the lagoon here, kept coming up higher and higher at night. So that's why it's a complex system. You're watching the inflows, and you got power demands as well, too. So the Snake River, it's so far downstream, um, the moisture is probably not going to make a difference there because they're going to fill those reservoirs first before they release it. And here's last year's runoff, and probably look at the similar conditions as that. 
2009 was, was much wider. So probably similar to that, just because you had to fill upstream bottles up first. And then flood control, the wrapping season, they'll still have big flows coming out of uh, Hell's Canyon for the river runners, about 10,000. Uh, CFS in March going to 15 to 17 in April, then back to about 15K later on in June. They do, do a good job uh, maintaining flow steady when the, the reds are down there to fish or laying the eggs and everything. And, uh, quite a bit of work they do. A couple other uh, things going on too with Idle Power coordinating some of the projects, not just theirs, but it's a cooperative cloud seeding program. State of Idaho. They started in the 1990s mostly in Payette because if they cloud seed in Payette, it's a quick exit to Hell's Canyon for the, for the flow. So that's why they started there. And then spread to the Boise, some then stopped and then started back up in the Boise, Big Wood, and Upper Snake areas where they cloud seed with the aircrafts and these ground based uh, generators to put silver iodine in the atmosphere as well, too. And the temperatures get to about 22 degrees. It's ideal for cloud seeding. They send the airplanes up there as well, too. They're, that's a blue sky picture. That's not very good. <laughs> I met the pilots. <laughs> yeah, he said, No, these guys have a higher level power. We, we, we uh, radio back to them. And they said, Yeah, we got ice in our wings. We're at 7,000 feet. Well, go higher. Go to 10,000 feet. Get more ice. And it's dangerous. Most people avoid a storm. And these guys are coming out and flying it because it's making a difference. So they're making about a million acre feet for a reasonable price as well, too, um, the seeding that's, that's going on. It's a sound science now. They know where the target zones are. There's even a ground-based generator for bogus as well, too. So Brad Wilson's pretty proud of that one, too. And so the other part they're doing with this is the offer for recharge. So this goes to Thousand Springs coming out by Twin Falls, basically, back in 1912. And uh, we started irrigating with flood irrigation. The spring started discharging more water as it peaked in the 50s. And then we started using different types of uh, irrigation system. Um, center pivots became more popular in the 70s. So the less water went into the ground in the aquifer, so it's going to start decreasing. That's when those water calls come out in 2009 and early 2000. So they're trying to figure out what to do with the aquifer. And so they started cloud seeding, but also using excess water to pump it back into the ground, basically, through canals and uh, where they dug their kids, basically. So they're trying to stabilize it to bring the aquifer back up. Well, what's unique about this, it's all within one state. So it's fairly easy to do because there are snowfalls in Wyoming, but Wyoming uses like 10% of the water because it's too cold to grow crops there. So they can't put water use like we do here. So they put it for their grown potatoes and crops, but also in an aquifer. Unlike the Ogallala aquifer that what's it in parts of eight or ten states, and you have different rivers coming into it, so that's why that aquifer keeps going down, because everybody keeps taking their what they can, and it's harder to manage while well, this is all within one state. So I thought it was some good work they're doing here and then in California, we're less than Kind of still decades ahead of California because they were they were still unregulating groundwater wells going in during the last drought. So now we got everything regulated here in Idaho. So a lot are they doing this 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 weather we've got going on now? Is there a cloud scene going on now that would have an effect on Idaho this time? Uh, with that warm spell, they took a break. And when the storms come back in, if it gets cold enough, they'd probably send the airplanes back up there. I'm thinking, like, we're, we're, we're into those storms. Yeah, at 22 degrees at 10,000 feet, it might be a critical temperature. So they're probably going to be up there, right? No, I bet they do. Yeah, so, yeah they send them back out. They're in a contract all winter long, yeah. basically. And if it gets cold enough, uh, they usually give a monthly update on, uh, on what they're doing or not. They had a little vacation in January and February. It just wasn't, there's was no moisture to see uh, or storms coming in either. Do they fly, do they fly just in and out of Boise or are there other airports like up north that they fly in and out of? I think just out of Boise right now. Yeah, where they can recharge and refill here. 
Well, that's the point I was going to try to make because all this good work they're doing here in, in the Snake River Basin, why not expand it to, to the Salmon Basin? So I wrote this long book back then. It was uh, 1,800 words. And my daughter cut it down to 500 words oh. <laughs> and, uh, about collaborative efforts to help save out of the salmon, but also the cloud seed in the Salmon River Basin and the Clearwater Basin, where they currently don't. So they could make good, cold, clean snow to melt and keep the river temperatures cooler rather than releasing Dwarshack water like they've been doing for 20 years. Or release less water from the upper upper snake and middle snake as well too. So I sent out the 26 uh, representatives and got one one leg back. Uh, but it's just uh, you see some things working and it should be able to expand to other parts of the state as well too. But we'll see what happens. What is the seeding that is done? Is it actually some type of material that they use? Yeah, it's still an iodine. Is, uh, it allows the moisture to condense on it, mm -hmm. and then falls to the to the ground as snow. And it's just like a dust particle that allows uh, uh, the moisture to to fall out of the atmosphere. And what did you say it's called? Silver iodine. Oh. Silver iodine. 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 Mm -hmm. So they actually they've been doing it since 1948 mm -hmm. in, in Idaho, experimenting with, with it. They tried to cloud seed uh, Sun Valley. And this one friend, Kenny Corrick, said, yeah, and then down in Palm Brown. They said, turn those burners off, because we can take down here. So now they have the target zones high to tune that to get it to fall here, you're seeing 10 to 15 miles away with the winds coming this way. And so it's a, back in 2017, they, there's NCAR. They did a lot of research uh, out of Boulder and the cloud seeding. So they came up in the Boise Mountains in 20, the winter of 2017 and put a radar station up. And then they send the, the planes by, you know, the radar on, within five minutes they saw the snow falling. And so they picked it up instantly. And that was a big year. They, they, their trailers got snowed under and everything. So, but they've learned a lot on how to maximize this process. And it can't work in all areas, but here in parts of Idaho, I think that there's room to expand it. So. I think that's about it. Um, oh, here's a, one more. Morley Nelson, who was a snow survey supervisor from 48 to 72, before he started his uh, third career, save the, the save the dolphin, hawks and raptors. But down in Chinden or Garden City, he had these Jeep built with the cat tracks on it. So here's Morley, you have the Forest Service coming to measure the snow. And his buddy in uh, Bellingham, Stan Larson, drove the Blackfoot and he bought the old one, fixed it up like an antique, and has it. Still says uh, Snowball Boise, Idaho, and knows it needs to get home here. So I talked to him once in a while, and but he's like 74 years old. And he goes and sits in his, his barn and he just drools over it. He loves it too much. <laughs> <laughs> he can't get rid of it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You got to take it out running. So the dog days will be here. So and I just put these uh, one last. One in this morning as well. Two. These are two seven-day forecasts for precipitation through the 10th through the 18th, with up to three inches coming in the Cascades, uh, one to two parts of Idaho, and then the second week, the 18th through the 26th, a little more still. But the temperatures. Uh, so here's this next week's temperatures being uh, fairly cold, uh, while next week it warms up. So this first half refers back to here with blue being colder than normal and red above average here. So it's going to be a cold week, um, which is good. And then the models beyond the 26th or so, I really haven't heard uh, what's happening. They're not in agreement yet. So hope we get more of this. What we're getting at. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. Everything. Rob, so you retired in 2019? 19, right. So what do you do? What's your day job today? Uh, we just got back from Ketchum from skiing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you obviously stay very involved in this. Right. Right. Is, is there some sort of a side to which you do the No, I talk for free. So <laughs> they still invite me to the Idaho Blackwater River Association. The river riders always want to know what the flow is. I don't, I'm a rafter myself, so I 
try to keep it interesting and entertaining for them yeah. once, once a year. Uh, I have a stack of papers, probably this high, of different stories and news events or stuff. Like I shared with you some about the snowcat that I should write into a book uh, so we don't forget about the, the past and what happened. Sure. So I've been thinking about that as well, too. And just keep my feet wet in it. There's a snow, Western Snow Conference in Salt Lake City next week. So I was going to go to that the week after next. That's good. Uh, thank you.